you for joining us for the Lead Prevention Regional Training. This training is hosted by the Ohio Chapter American Academy of Pediatrics with support from the Ohio Department of Health. And we wanna thank them for their support and collaboration for these, with these trainings. Um, this is a two-part live webinar. This first part will cover epidemiology of lead um, childhood lead poisoning and recommendations for lead testing. The second part will be this Friday, May 29th from 12.15 to 1.30 p.m. And we will cover medical management of elevated blood levels and useful resources that can be used with families. We have attendees from many different professions that will be joining us um, for the trainings. So we are welcoming any questions that you may have. You can use the chat box to ask questions and these will be answered at the end of the training. If we don't get to all of the questions today, we will make sure that we have them answered for you on Friday. Please keep your lines muted and your cameras turned off throughout the training. Um, our speakers will have their videos on while they're talking, but other than that, um, videos aren't necessary. And any comments, if you can't hear us, if you um, aren't able to see something like that, please put that um, in the chat box and we'll make sure that we um, try to sh troubleshoot those problems. I also wanted to take the time to talk about our quality improvement project that we will be launching in July. This is a six month project for primary care practices and we're offering 25 MOC part four points. The global aim of our project is for all children living in a high risk zip code or with Medicaid insurance to have a lead test completed um, and ordered at 12 and 24 month well visits. We have a variety of different resources um, that we've created for this project. We have a resource guide for physicians and then a rat card for families. We also have an interact interactive lead prevention website um, and you can find this at www.ohioaap.org backslash lead. And this website allows you to look up high risk zip codes using a map and um, it's very interactive and all the resources are also posted there. Um, this quality improvement project will allow for us to help with practice coaching, creating sustainable processes, and establishing protocol for lead testing and follow-up. And we'll have action period calls to work through um, the data and talk about ways that these levels can testing can be improved. And it's um, a pilot project, so we're very excited to kick this off um, in July. So if you're interested in participating or would like more information, please feel free to reach out to me. My name is Alex Miller, and I'm the program manager for lead prevention with the Ohio AAP. And um, you can also find for more information on our, our website that's also listed there. And then at this time, I would like to introduce our speakers. Dr. Parna Bull is the Ohio AAP Lead Prevention Medical Director. She's an Associate Professor at Pediatrics, Case Western uh, Reserve University School of Medicine, and works at UH Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. Dr. Nicholas Newman is Assistant Professor of Pediatrics and Environmental Health, uh, University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, the Director of Pediatric Environmental Health and uh, Lead Clinic, and at Cincinnati Children's Hospital is where he works. Um, and then the, the disclosures are also listed there on this page. So we will go ahead and get started um, with Dr. Newman. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for tuning in um, early on a, a Tuesday morning after the long weekend. So um, I'm going to start us off uh, just talking about uh, the learning objectives, and then we'll, we'll get right into um, uh, today's uh, topic. So uh, first, uh, we want to review the epidemiology of lead exposure in children, uh, recognize what the sh short and long-term implications are, and then uh, figure out what to do, like anticipatory guidance, me medical management, and medical management recommendations uh, regarding lead exposure in children. So, next slide, Alex. So, uh, part one is is today, which is uh, epidemiology, and then lead screening and testing, and then uh, responding to a test, medical management, patient follow-up, and 
resources, that'll be for the next time. So the way um, I think about uh, most uh, disease is in, in the context of a epidemiologic triad. So, you know, the reason that you get uh, illness really is just uh, a function of host factors, uh, agent factors, and environmental factors, like environment, like where this is all uh, occurring. Next slide. And, um, so, you know, classically, this is thought of in uh, infectious disease epidemiology, uh, where, you know, you have a host, and let's say it's cholera, and, you know, the host, you know, depending on their age and hydration status, may get sicker or not as sick. Um, and, you know, the environment consists of a contaminated water source, and the agent is, you know, Vibrio cholerae, you know, the bacteria that we know that causes this profuse diarrhea and, and um, um, Etc. And I bring this up because cholera was probably one of the first illnesses where we were able to start to uh, tease these uh, things apart. Next slide. And you know, I'm kind of transferring this over to lead. So, you know, what are the host factors? So, you know, we're worried about young children. So, you know, age and nutrition and their behaviors will uh, contribute uh, the child's environment. Like, so if there's no lead in the environment, you're not going to get exposed to it regardless of what the host factors are, right? So um, it could be, um, and we'll talk about this, could be older housing, it could be a parent's uh, occupation or hobby, it could be a, a, a source of food that's uh, accidentally contaminated or a toy. Um, and then lead itself is the agent. So like if the agent has to get to the, the host somehow or another. And uh, that's where the, and out of that, like, comes the, the, you know, quote, disease, right? So a combination of host, agent, and environmental factors. Next slide, please. So uh, what is lead? I, very briefly, uh, lead is a metal. Um, it, uh, if you look on the periodic table, it's, um, what's, it comes in a bunch of different forms. But uh, we, we think of it mostly as lead plus two. So plus two is is like the you know the chemical way that we we think about uh, certain metals. You know they're usually like they're plus one or plus two or plus three or plus four, and that just tells you how it's going to interact with other things. Um, it's been used by humans for thousands and thousands of years, and toxicity was first formally described um, about 2,200 years ago. And a lot of people think of it as the first pollutant because it, you know, humans pulled it out of the ground. It wasn't, you know, just coming out naturally like some other things, like a volcanic eruption or something. Um, this is stuff that we intentionally had to dig out. Um, and um, the acute toxic exposures have been described all throughout history. Um, you know, the, the the ancient Greeks knew about it. The Romans had laws about where lead could be smelted within a city. Uh, the, you know, the medieval time, they had uh, personal protective equipment that they had uh, fashioned out of sheep bladders or something, you know, to prevent people from getting exposed to lead. So, um, and this photograph I took, it was, you know, it, you know, danger flaking lead paint. So, I mean, <clears throat> we're still dealing with this problem uh, uh, today. Next slide. So, um, as you can see, um, Humans started making lead, um, uh, pulling lead out of the ground a few thousand years ago. The Romans were pretty good at making a lot of, 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 of lead. Uh, it turns out that it was basically a, kind of a byproduct of making coins. And so um, the silver mines also, uh, you often find lead uh, in with them. The same thing with gold. Um, and so um, the uh, they wanted to find a use for the slag, basically, and so they used it to line the aqueducts and a, a whole bunch of other uses. And then, as you can see, um, as you know, we, we've uh, we're making you know many times more lead than what uh, the, the Romans were. Next, please. And just to put it into a historical perspective, on 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 the on the left, like as an ancient person. Uh, you know, this is from bones, like we estimate what the lead exposure was. On the right is someone who's acutely lead poisoned, and the middle was a typical American, like from the late 20th century. 
and each dot rec uh, represents a uh, part of the body burden of lead uh, that's in the bone. And if you click again, Alex, um, the thing to point out is that over history, we haven't been exposed to that much lead. Ancient means peoples from about seven to 10,000 years ago in uh, the Americas. So although we talk about, oh, lead levels have come down a lot, really they're pretty high compared to what they have been historically. Next slide. So um, basically we just have to understand that like lead uh, exposure is dramatically increased over history. And, and you could see from that previous graph, like it's because we're using it in a whole bunch of different things. Next, please. So where do we find lead? Where in the environment do we find lead? Next slide. So common sources of lead, uh, lead-based uh, paint dust, um, occupational take-home exposure, um, about 80% of kids in Ohio are exposed through lead paint in their home. Um, the, um, we worry about water, food, uh, soil, dirt, uh, is particularly in urban areas. Uh, certain toys, toys are not supposed to have lead on them because uh, lead is actually a banned uh, substance for toys, but um, they're not maybe as carefully monitored as they, they sh uh, could be. And um, that finds its way into kids all the time. At our uh, clinic in Cincinnati, this is, um, um, I, I've seen every single one of these exposures, basically. Um, the uh, cosmetics and ceremonial powders, typically these are, um, typically they're kind of traditional of, uh, or, and, and sometimes imported from other countries, but we've also had issues with, um, um, you know, stuff that's sold uh, purely for a, a general domestic uh, uh, audience, audience, so to speak. Um, spices and then traditional uh, medications. In, in fact, there are some medications that, because uh, these metals were considered, like lead and a whole bunch of other metals were considered kind of magical and had special properties. And so um, over time, there's been these beliefs that they, they would be useful for medicinal purposes. And uh, one, one of them in particular, Greta, which is used in uh, Central America and, and uh, Mexico, uh, it can contain like 80 to 90% lead. And uh, kids, kids who get that for colic or whatever get a, can get a massive exposure to, to lead. Next, please. So um, if you look over time, like one of the biggest uh, ways that we got uh, exposed to lead, we meaning like, you know, the older folks who are taking care of all these kids now, uh, was from lead and gasoline. And you can see on the, on the left, it shows like how much lead is used in, uh, was used in gasoline. Uh, that's on the, the, uh, the, the blue line. Um, and then the child blood lead levels from uh, a national uh, uh, survey. So the average lead level back uh, in the mid 70s, we think was around like 16. And now like we're, you know, basically close to one. And a lot of that decrease was just from taking lead out of gasoline because it was just so um, uh, prevalent everywhere. Next slide. So um, high risk occupations, uh, we've included a couple of photos here. But uh, from my personal experience, I, I would say construction is uh, probably one of the biggest uh, concerns because parents will bring home lead dust uh, from a deteriorating paint from houses that they might be working on on their clothes and then the kids play with them and they, they get them on their, uh, uh, from their clothes into the child's mouth. Um, obviously lead acid batteries uh, and then people who recycle them those are high risk occupations, uh, though, though they tend to be fairly well regulated. Uh, paint and plastics, there is still some uh, paints that contain lead, particularly uh, those used for bridge painting or uh, military uh, applications. And lead has been used as a plastic uh, stabilizer. Uh, welders, uh, police and military personnel, mainly uh, when they go to firing ranges, um, and depending on uh, what type of uh, police or military personnel uh, 
that may only be like once a year that they do that to recertify, but it's just something to keep in mind. Um, uh, plumbers, pipe fitters, particularly people working with older stuff or industrial applications, glass makers, artists, because non house paints are still allowed to have lead and other heavy metals like cadmium, et cetera. Um, pottery, because of the uh, potential with uh, lead and glazes, although that's uh, more of a problem in other countries than here. Uh, auto repair. Um, because it's still lead on the highways from the legacy use of leaded gasoline, uh, it finds its way onto the chassis of the car, as well as uh, ongoing use on uh, bridge paint and some uh, paint on the, the lines in the, in the road made with lead. And the indoor firing ranges, obviously, I mean, I've had fa uh, parents who work at these places and um, They'll bring home lead like accidentally, you know, particularly if they're doing like maintenance or cleaning or something like that. So, next slide. Um, yeah, if you just click it, we'll get that animation. Can you go back, please? Yeah. Um, so, if you look, um, the you know, percentage increase in blood lead level, uh, most of it is from dust, and a lot of the dust is coming from the house, house dust from deteriorated lead paint. Uh, lead in water is not an insignificant uh, source. However, the dust is a much bigger uh, uh, concern. Um, and um, if we can go on to the next slide. Uh, so lead in, in drinking water, uh, basically lead, in, in, so their service, I mean, if anyone's followed the Flint uh, water crisis, um, you know, this whole, you know, know, who even knew what a lead a service line was until then, right? So there are lines in the street and they're not made of lead, but the lines coming from the, the, the large pipes in the street coming into the house, so the, depending on the age of when the, this pipe was built uh, or rather installed, it could contain lead. So um, uh, nationwide, uh, that those lead service lines were banned in, in 1986, but obviously we didn't go back and change all of them. It was up to different uh, municipalities to, uh, you know, they could set their own rules. Cincinnati banned them in 1926. Um, lead could be in plumbing and fixtures up until 2014. So like those fancy, like bent fixtures, uh, those could contain lead. Um, US EPA has an action level of 15 parts per billion. That, that's uh, under review right now. But that's not like necessarily looking to see what comes out of your particular tap. It's just to make sure that the water system overall is not delivering lead to um, consumers. Um, and the current testing really isn't based on actual use scenarios. Uh, you know, it's not like how people would typically use um, the water the way, it, way it's collected. And, I've included this uh, this picture, this screenshot, basically. But what it's, it shows you, right, so green checks mean no lead, and yellow means there's lead present. And if you look, you you know, this is just a neighborhood in Cincinnati. There are some places where none of the houses have any lead service lines, but like just a few doors down, the entire thing is lead. I mean. You can see one neighbor where the in, there were everything has been is not lead, and the people next door where the, all the like the the street the, from the street to their house and the and the, the from the street to the property line and from the property line to the house all have lead, and so you can't just like kind of a priori know whether there's uh, lead uh, a lead service line in the house. Next slide, please. So uh, back to housing because older housing. Uh, is really the, the thing that we're worried about. Uh, in Ohio, about two thirds of the housing was built during the lead paint era. So we'll say that was like, you know, prior to 1978, which is uh, the, the higher risk housing. Next slide, please. So how many, how did so many homes get painted with lead paint? Well, that's a good question since like, we know that it's been dangerous for years, right? Next slide. So uh, childhood lead poisoning was first described like medically in the United States in the late 19th century. The early 20th century uh, ophthalmologist in uh, Australia uh, basically described childhood lead poisoning coming from 
deteriorating house paint. So like the current scenario that we're dealing with now. Uh, soon after uh, Europe started banning lead interior paint, and um, as you can see, uh, by the 1920s, it was pretty clear that like both the company making it admitted that it was a poison, and then the the Europeans basically started banning um, lead paint. Uh, ultimately, the um, lead paint, lead based house paint was completely banned in the United States in 1978. There was a voluntary uh, a decrease in the in the fifth, uh, 1950. Next, next slide, please. So just at the same time that the Europeans started banning lead paint, the paint manufacturers in the United States actually started marketing uh, lead paint to uh, children and families in the in the form of a paint book. And uh, this is in part how we we you know. A lead paint was was you know more expensive and was you know uh, there was a certain um, people liked it because it was pretty durable and so um, but uh, also people knew lead was bad and so uh, they had to like, kind of create a, a marketing uh, scheme to get people to buy more of it. Next slide. So I think uh, we switch over to Dr. Bowl now. Thank you. It's important to point out that, um, that age of housing is an issue, but equally important is the, ma is the maintenance of the house, right? So as Dr. Newman um, discussed, paint chips, paint dust are important sources of lead exposure um, here in Ohio and around the country. Um, and issues around maintenance of the house, but also neighborhood infrastructure um, is really important when thinking about uh, kids, um, kids' risk for lead exposure. Next slide, please. And so in addition to some of the historic um, information that Dr. Newman shared, I think it's important to understand um, some of the historical basis around persistent disparities in, uh, in lead poisoning, which um, lead to health inequities. Um, so just a little bit of background, when we talk about environmental justice and environmental injustice, we're talking about uh, the disproportionate burden of environmental health hazards borne by different populations. Um, and lead poisoning is a really important example of, uh, of an environmental injustice that leads to, to disparities. Um, and so one particularly vulnerable population with lead poisoning and all environmental health hazards um, are children. We'll talk a little bit um, Dr. Newman described sort of host factors being important in the epidemiologic triad of disease and talk a little bit about what makes children especially vulnerable in a moment. Um, and then also specific populations, historically marginalized communities, uh, minority race, low income, these are all risk factors uh, for lead poisoning. Um, and in fact, for example, um, African American children have almost a three times higher risk of elevated blood lead levels than other populations. I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the systemic issues that underpin that fact. Next slide, please. Discriminatory housing and lending policies um, are an example of uh, a systemic issue that leads to persistent uh, disparities in lead exposure and also to other health inequities. I think there are a few different reasons why it's important to understand this context. I think sometimes when we talk about home maintenance and home cleaning as um, important preventive um, uh, uh, factors uh, to prevent lead exposure, it's important that we avoid framing that language in any way that seems to be blaming or judging um, the people who are exposed. And I also think that as advocates to understand um, some of the, the policies that underpin these disparities is important for us um, as, we, as we act to prevent lead exposure in the first place. Um, so just as an example here, um, as, as many of you know, redlining describes a practice uh, a discriminatory housing and lending practice in which um, there's systematic disinvestment in minority communities. Um, the, the term uh, applied to um, policies that the Federal Housing Administration put in place kind of in the New Deal era, um, and the red lines refer to um, communities that were indicated with the color red, um, like here on the right is a map of Cleveland from the 1940s, um, and the red areas indicated neighborhoods that were too risky for mortgage insurance. Um, and pretty invariably, those were predominantly minority communities here in Cleveland, um, African-American communities. Um, and it, that's not just 
speculative. There are there is text from um, the Federal Housing Administration um, policy uh, and practice kind of guidelines from the era um, that describe ex pretty explicitly recommending even physical barriers to ensure that uh, racially seg segregated neighborhoods um, would would persist. And so that lack of investment, that generational lack of investment in historically African American neighborhoods, has resulted. Um, in the neighborhood infrastructure uh, being um, being uh, uh, less well maintained um, and um, really uh, a, a greater source of uh, of risk for lead exposure um, than neighborhoods with generational investment. Um, so I think it's really important to understand that systemic racism, um, as evidenced in um, these kinds of housing and lending policies underpin um, some of the persistent disparities um, in health outcomes, including a lead poisoning. Next slide, please. I want to talk a little bit about what makes children a specific, uh, specifically vulnerable population. It has to do with their unique physiology and developmental appropriate behaviors. Um, next slide, please. As you can see, um, children put things in their mouth uh, that are not, uh, not necessarily foods, developmentally appropriate way of exploring their world. Um, young infants too um, are just, are, are have a more limited diet and are just um, being introduced to complementary foods. Um, eating things off the floor is common. Um, kids are crawling around. Um, as kids are older, their uh, diet becomes more varied. And as we'll talk about in a moment, um, those uh, dietary restrictions can also um, lead to increased risk, risk factors for lead absorption. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, kids are exploring their world by putting things in their mouth. There, are, there may also be kids, for example, with iron deficiency who are doing that more than others. They have a behavior called pica where they're um, eating non-foods um, uh, more regularly. Um, older children um, need to think about uh, to lead exposure for older children with developmental delay who may have persistent hand-to-mouth behaviors. And again, um, those who are iron deficient and are exhibiting those pica behaviors of eating non-foods um, are some specific risk factors in those older kids. Next slide, please. So in addition to these developmentally normal behaviors and some of the features of um, infant and young children's diets that put them at higher risk um, for lead exposure. Uh, their GI physiology, their gastrointestinal physiology, uh, also makes them at higher risk uh, for lead absorption. Um, and some of that is uh, due to the, the uh, transporter that absorbs both lead and other um, similar, uh, similarly charged metals. So Dr. Newman described how lead is, uh, is, is two plus when it's um, when we're exposed to it and when we, we absorb it. And the same is true of iron and calcium. So the same transporter that, um, that, that absorbs lead also absorbs iron and calcium, which um, helps to explain why children who are iron deficient uh, are at higher risk for, for lead absorption because that same transporter that's kind of hungry for iron is also um, going to absorb uh, lead. And this chart here on the right just kind of indicates um, the differences in GI absorption um, uh, over time. Um, so children under two absorb over 50% of the lead that they ingest, but, but adults um, absorb much less than that, about 15%. Next slide, please. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about um, the impacts of lead exposure in children. Next slide, please. Um, as Dr. Newman expressed, this is definitely not a new problem. It's an old problem. It's been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, but there, there are not only persistent concerns, but sort of evolving concerns around lead exposure. Um, so we're going to talk about um, uh, the fact that thankfully acute and symptomatic lead poisoning in the United States is growing more in common. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what the reference level of the, that's currently five micrograms per deciliter, what does the reference level mean? Um, it's important to note that there are technical concerns too around the measurement of lead levels, especially as that reference level drops, the margin for error in testing technology becomes more significant. Um, if you're looking at plus or minus two, three, or four micrograms per deciliter, that becomes more significant as the reference level drops. Um, and I'll just point out without getting too far in the weeds with that, that especially um, some point of care devices um, have uh, some of the higher margins for error. So interpreting the results um, can be tricky. Uh, 
Um, and then again, we're going to talk a little bit about what the reference level means that it's not the, that level of five is not a diagnostic or prognostic level, but it's that predicts a particular clinical outcome in any individual patient, but that it's a public health action level. And we'll talk about that um, in a moment. So next slide, please. As I said, thankfully, acute and symptomatic uh, lead poisoning is rare. Uh, here are some of the symptoms that you can see for children who are acutely lead poisoned. Um, changes in behavior, abdominal pain, change, changes in mental status, so not uh, being lethargic, um, altered levels of consciousness, um, headaches, um, and then even seizures with high levels of lead exposure. Next slide, please. So while acute and symptomatic uh, lead poisoning is growing more rare, um, as we all know, there's no safe level of lead and chronic exposure um, it, it causes toxicity as well. And the primary target of that toxicity is a child's brain. Um, it, lead can impact pretty much every organ system, um, but we're concerned about children's neurologic development, primarily with chronic lead exposure. Um, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about the fact that, um, that, there, that decreases in IQ are observed at a population level, um, four to six points uh, decrement in IQ for every 10 micrograms per deciliter of blood lead. Um, also an association with behavioral problems. Um, and as I mentioned, there's no safe level. So um, the, 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 there's no safe threshold. These effects um, are observed at even quote low levels of blood lead and they're not reversible. As we mentioned to iron deficiency, um, it, it affects the absorption of lead, but also can exacerbate the effect of lead because being iron deficient itself um, uh, uh, can cause neurodevelopmental uh, harm. Um, and you can see here, I'm gonna show you in a, a, a graph in the next slide that this relationship between IQ and lead exposure is not a linear relationship. So go to the next slide, please. You can see that relatively speaking, um, the uh, impact of blood lead on IQ the most significant impact occurs at the quote, lower levels of lead exposure. Um, and this is uh, data pooled from lead cohorts all around the world um, to, to uh, see if we could detect uh, an effect of lead on IQ. Um, so there are of course many factors that um, contribute to intelligence, to development, to, to cognition, um, but it's pretty clear from a very large uh, uh, sample from around the world that um, that blood lead affects IQ and again in a nonlinear way so that the, the most significant decrement you can see occurs at those quote low levels. Next slide, please. Similarly, similarly um, this is uh, looking actually at school performance um, and this is uh, looking at performance on standardized testing um, in the Detroit public schools and um, looking at the relationship between uh, lead levels and, um, and probability of failure in these, um, in these uh, proficiency tests. Uh, and these, this relationship uh, that shows an increased risk for school failure that's associated with uh, increasing blood lead level, um, this relationship persisted after adjusting for grade level, gender, race, language, maternal education, um, and socioeconomic status. Um, so again, multifactorial, obviously, school performance um, uh, risks for impaired school per performance are multifactorial, but it's very clear that uh, lead exposure and lead poisoning um, is a risk factor. Um, and that, that with increasing lead levels, the, the risk for school failure increases. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, behavioral issues, especially deficits in attention, um, are associated with, with lead exposure as well. Um, again, a, a multifactorial issue, um, but, uh, it, but there, we estimate that 25% of ADHD may be uh, attributable to elevated blood lead levels. Um, and um, other kinds of behavioral issues, antisocial behaviors, um, increased risk for criminal behavior and incarceration is also associated with lead exposure. Next slide, please. These are uh, issues that have lifetime, lifelong consequences. So, um, you know, we, while we may be focused on um, proficiency tests uh, in studying um, risk for school failure, you know, if you look at uh, the risks to children who are suffering these impacts as they age, 
Um, children with elevated blood lead levels are more likely to drop out of high school, seven times more likely to drop out of high school. Um, and then what does that mean over the course of a lifetime? Um, impacts on lifetime earnings, on lifetime health um, associated with, um, with that uh, risk for lower educational attainment. Next slide, please. When risk factors um, uh, are examined, looking at, um, at people who have interacted with the criminal justice system, who have committed crimes, who are incarcerated, what are um, some of the um, social and environmental factors that, um, that that population has in common? And again, many factors um, that have been described for a long time, um, but actually um, environmental exposures, such as lead exposures, I think historically have been underappreciated and are now um, more, better understood as, uh, as a really important part of that, um, of that, uh, of the risk factors that, um, that contribute to a criminal disposition. Next slide, please. What does all that mean? We talked about um, uh, impacts on lifelong, uh, lifelong earning potential, risk factors for criminal um, uh, behavior, these all have economic consequences too. And I think it's important to point out that this amounts to billions of dollars of year, uh, per year, not only in medical costs, educational accommodations, but also in these lifelong um, uh, consequences of, of diminished productivity, increased risk for, for incarceration. Um, as you can see in just one county, Mahoning County, um, the cost is estimated at $500,000 per year. Um, and the return on investment for lead poisoning prevention, I think if you um, advance, there's a comparison with the investment, uh, return on investment for childhood vaccines. Um, so uh, even with the most conservative estimates for the return on investment for lead poisoning prevention, for every dollar invested, we see a return of $17. But 17 to $221, the range is big because it depends on um, how wide you cast your net and how, um, how far into the future you're calculating those benefits. The only thing that compares really is childhood vaccines, um, which have also a very high return on investment, but maybe not even quite as high as lead poisoning prevention. Next slide, please. So talked, we talked about the fact that the highest risk groups for um, exposure and impacts of lead poisoning are young children, um, and that uh, demographic factors uh, racial factors, economic factors can uh, place children at higher risk for exposure. It's worth noting that um, recent immigrants, especially refugees, are at high risk for exposure as well. Um, and then uh, we also want to point out that these impacts uh, have lifelong consequences in the elderly, um, that, uh, that childhood lead exposure um, has lifelong consequences um, that we can observe in an increase in all-cause mortality in elderly individuals who have a history of lead exposure, um, and that, uh, that pregnant, and, uh, pregnant women and women of, of childbearing age are also um, especially at risk. Next slide, please. So to summarize, we talked about the uh, many domains of, of um, impacts of lead exposure, including um, impacts on school performance, decreased IQ, behavioral problems, delinquency, incarceration, and there are also impacts on um, risk for premature birth, um, which we didn't get into it at length, but is worth mentioning as pregnant women are at especially high risk as well. And I think at this point, I turn it back over to Dr. Newman. Hi, yes, I'm, I'm back. Uh, hopefully this won't be too awful for you. So, um, one of the questions I often get is, um, you know, how is it possible that um, these lower lead levels appear to have more uh, impact on IQ or or school performance? And um, we, we, to be honest, we don't know um, the the answer to that. But it, it's been um, demonstrated also with some other uh, environmental toxicants. So, like in my realm of 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 environmental health, this is not that un un uncommon. But what we think is ultimately is going on is that uh, lead basically replaces calcium in certain parts of the body. And it'll bind to the same receptors like in your brain that, um, that um, uh, calcium would. 
But the thing is, is like, and this is where you really get into the weeds of toxicology, but just follow me for a second. So for most of these metals that, that we eat and they're, you know, eat pretty safely, um, you know, calcium starts as plus two and it stays plus two the whole time, like through your body. But lead has like at least three different states that it can be in. And so if it changes while it's in your body, let's say from plus two to plus four, then all of a sudden there are these free radicals around that are can attack some of the membranes and, and other parts of your, your body. And that's, we think, part of like how it's doing the, the damage. So these calcium receptors in the brain are really important with how the, 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 the brain prunes connections between different neurons. So, and, and this is something that's going on a lot in children under, uh, certainly under six, but like, you know, for kids under two, uh, a lot. And um, in addition, it interferes with uh, production of hemoglobin because it, um, 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 it inhibits one of the, the enzymes that helps to make uh, hemoglobin delta aminolytic acid synthase. And um, it also is incredibly uh, toxic to mitochondria. And so when you think about it, like there are so many organisms on the whole planet that have mitochondria. And in fact, you know, if you look at the literature around lead, there are people who work with plants who write around the toxicity of lead. There are people who work with insects who talk about the toxicity of lead, with mammals, other invertebrates. So it's toxic to just everything on the whole planet. And um, what we've also found, and this is what, what might explain like this, this, this drop in IQ, um, you know, this non-linear effect, um, is picomolar. So picomolar is a very, very tiny amount, but it's, it, it makes micromolar, which is a tiny amount, look enormous, right? So picomolar levels of lead work about the same as micromolar levels of calcium in certain parts of the brain. So basically, a tiny amount of lead could trigger the firing of, of, of a receptor or a turn on some process in cells before the normal amount of calcium would have caused that to happen. And so we're wondering if maybe that could be a part of it. It's a very complicated thing to try to understand, to be completely honest. But um, it's, suffice it to say, a lot of what goes on with lead is that it mimics these other things like calcium and iron, and it gets into places where the body thinks that calcium and iron should be. Next slide, please. So this um, is, um, here we go. So this, this is to try to illustrate what happens in the brain when you're exposed to lead. And this is a study of, of using the, the Cincinnati lead study cohort, which um, they were um, recruited as uh, very young um, children. Like it was from a, uh, from a, a prenatal clinic. Uh, in Cincinnati back in the late 1970s, and they're still being followed today. In fact, like a, 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 a study on bone uh, development has just uh, been completed. And this is like people who are in their 40s now. So what they did was they, they tried to create, so th this is a, a neuroimaging of the brain, looking at sizes of different parts of the brain. And basically what they did was they created kind of and a typical brain, you know, by scanning a whole bunch of different people, and they created a, a, what we call a typical brain, Dr. Cecil and her group uh, at Cincinnati Children's. And then what they did was they scanned the brains of the uh, participants in this study, and they looked to see were there changes in the size of different parts of the brain compared to a typical brain. And what they found was that there was, and the, those areas were most significantly different in the frontal and prefrontal cortex, as well as the cerebellum. And I, I, I've, I've emphasized this because the, the, the 
prefrontal cortex is really part of the brain. It's like the captain of the brain, I, I think of it. You know, so that is where attention comes from. That's where impulse control comes from. And what we're finding is, you know, what has been described for years is that children who are exposed to lead, even relatively low amounts of it, have problems with um, attention and impulse control. And this might actually be starting to give us uh, an insight into how uh, lead is actually affecting the, uh, the brain. Uh, now, we've also looked at uh, functional MRI, but I didn't include that in here because that's very uh, kind of hard to illustrate. But this is really just to illustrate that it isn't just, th th there's a real thing going on here that, um, and, and we can, and it's real enough that we, we can measure it. And it's affecting the brain. Next slide, please. So uh, next I'd like to talk about uh, lead screening. So this, might better be called surveillance or case finding. Because when you're screening someone for something, let's say you're screening them for colon cancer, right? So they get a colonoscopy, you find there's a polyp, you remove the polyp, and now this person is not gonna get cancer at all from that polyp, right? But with what Dr. Bowl just said was that, you know, there's no threshold for effect, so like no amount is good. And so we don't know how to reverse it. So like by the time you find someone who's exposed, they're already in a quote disease state. And um, so this is why the AAP and the CDC and you know the Higher Department of Health and local health departments recommend that this is be that this be done, because what we're trying to do is to figure out where people are getting exposed. So this can both we could both address the person who's exposed, but then also prevent other people from being exposed. Next slide, please. So the purpose essentially is to identify cases for which primary prevention has failed. And you know, maybe the, the example I would use would be, uh, let's say Flint, Michigan, right? So they, they detected an increase in childhood blood lead levels. This was reported uh, following a change in the water, uh, uh, the, the water source. Well, the, the, there was primary prevention in place at that water source before to prevent people from getting exposed to lead. And unfortunately, the way we detected it was through lead testing of children. But this is the, one of the main purposes. So then we can either treat or do environmental intervention. But a lot of the interventions are public health interventions, these interventions. It might be fixing the house. It might be, as they're doing in Flint, replacing all the pipes, et cetera. But the goal is to reduce the blood levels as rapidly as possible. Because one of the things that we've al we also learned from the Cincinnati lead study was that it wasn't necessarily the blood lead level that you had when you were one or two that predicted how your whole the rest of your life was going to go. It was what was it at around school age because that told you what was the total exposure over that critical point in, in uh, brain development. And so it's not just a point, it's an area under the curve, if you will. So it's like, what's the total am amount of lead exposure during that critical time? Next slide. So who to test for lead? Well, Ohio state law requires that children live in high risk zip codes and um, who uh, are insured by Medicaid to have their lead level checked. Other high risk children, three to six years old, particularly if they've, uh, and it's also the law if they've not been checked at one or two. People who live in pre-1950s housing or pre-1978 housing with recent renovation or there's clinical suspicion of lead exposure. So like, you know, the parents are talking to you. I had this, I mean, I've had cases where people come in and they're like, oh, I'm concerned because my, you know, child's been chewing on the railing outside. Granted, they had their testing at one year and, and two year, but when it was tested after the, because, you know, this person came in with a complaint, it was around 50. So previously it was low enough that there wouldn't have been anything done. So I, I think you, you you know, the guidelines are guidelines, but they're not meant to, uh, it's not a straitjacket that you don't have uh, clinical uh, decision making. Uh, but zip code doesn't explain the whole story either. Next slide, please. There are lead screening questions. Um, I am not going to spend that much time with these, um, but if you do find that someone is positive, you definitely need to test them. Um, 
and because the screening questions don't go, do a good job at discriminating whether people are exposed to lead or not, simply because it can be coming from so many different sources. Next slide, please. And so they did a systematic review of these questionnaires, actually a couple of different systematic reviews, and this was, um, um, one of them was by Cochrane, but, um, and what they we found was that basically the lead screening questionnaires were about, uh, they didn't even do as well as flipping a coin as to whether to decide whether to uh, check the lead level. And the US Preventive Services Task Force actually said the questionnaires were not useful. So what we need to do is just follow the ODH or local public health guidance on testing. Next slide. So the requirements that all 12 and 20 month, 24 month old children with Medicaid must have a lead test. And then children who are 36 to 72 months old must have a, a if they have a, a high rate Medicaid children, must have it unless they were previously tested. However, it's not, if, if you have, if, if there's some other high risk situation going on, then it, it, the law does not prevent you from not ordering it. Next, next slide. So I get a lot of questions like, can you do, can we just do a finger stick or does it have to be a venous draw? So for this initial like testing, you know, in your office, it's completely appropriate to do capillary testing, but there are recommendations as to when those need to be followed up depending on what they are, if it's, pop, if, if it's five or above. Venous sampling is nice because you don't have the issue with uh, contamination on the skin. Um, having said that, if you have a child who has a capillary level that's high and the venous level is low, that's telling you that child is probably exposed to lead somewhere, and, but it hasn't gotten into their system yet. And so that might be actually an opportunity for primary prevention, right? So, um, but if you don't test it, you'll never find any of, uh, any of this. It is not appropriate if you've had a high lead level in the past for a child to recheck it with a capillary draw. Next slide. So most of this is handled by the clinical labs, but people who are doing the testing in their offices need to be aware that the, that the state law requires that the, these lead results be reported to the Ohio Department of Health in a timely manner. And they're stored in a central database so that the uh, case management and follow-up can be uh, managed appropriately. So, you know, we live in this, this crazy time with uh, COVID-19. This was supposed to be an in-person uh, training, right? And we're doing it by Zoom, like we're doing everything by Zoom. And so, um, but we can't do primary care by Zoom. We can't do vaccines by Zoom. And so, as, as we know, there's a lot of kids who have not gotten a lot of their basic primary care over the last few months. And it may be hard to get that, them in. And there has been a corresponding decrease not only in, in vaccinations, but in, in lead testing down in you know, some places 50 to 70% decrease. Um, in addition, there are kids who are, who are in houses. I mean, the, if housing is 80% of the problem, they've been trapped at home, like sheltering at home in a house that's full of lead hazards. Like that doesn't sound like a good combination, right? I mean, there may be other hazards in the house, but this is the one that we can probably detect. And you know, there's some talk about you know, trying to do um, something to um, try to just like smash all these kids through and do mass testing. But, you know, if there's got to be proper follow up for things and, and anticipatory guidance, I, I mean, you know, there's, there's still a very, very needed place for a medical home for children so that all the, you know, how many kids like, get something done and then they never follow up? Well, if you have, if, I mean, the whole point of a medical home is there's someone who knows what's going on, they're going to follow up with them. So um, um, I, I think part of our, um, you know, the, the QI project we he have here could be very useful to practices that are trying to get kids back in for the rest of their primary care for, you know, one and, and two years of age. Next slide. So in summary, children are mostly exposed to lead through deteriorating house paint. But there are many other sources since lead is a ubiquitous contaminant and we've been using it for thousands of years. And, and 
the, the, the biggest issue that we had with using leaded gasoline is that it contaminated the soil. And so it, it's gotten into a lot of places that, that we wouldn't have anticipated it would have gotten to. Do their physiology, and as Dr. Bowl said, children are uniquely vulnerable to lead. Um, the brains are developing, they absorb more nutrients, including you know, toxic, and, in, and also more toxicants than, than adults. Um, and lead exposure increases the risk for school failure, behavior problems, and risk for incarceration. And these are not trivial problems. And there's actually something that we can do about it. Um, you know, we can't fix every, everything, but this is something that we can do. And Ohio law requires testing for high-risk children, and that's part of how we can get things to happen to try to help these kids and to change the outcome for them. Next slide, I think it's uh, questions, right? Hi, yes. So um, thank you, Dr. Bull and Dr. Newman for speaking on this important topic. Again, we wanted to thank um, ODH for their support as well as some of the material and photos used in this presentation. They have great resources on lead prevention on their website and their website is also linked on our Ohio AAP lead website as well if you'd like to um, view that. So at this point, um, we will go ahead and take questions. But before that, um, I wanted to mention again, part two will be on Friday, uh, May 29th from 12.15 to 1.30. Um, after this, I will, after questions, I will go over some of the resources that we have available that we've created specifically for our lead prevention program that I'm excited to share with you. Um, and then we will see you on Friday. So before then, uh, questions, and I think there was already one question um asked but i also wanted to mention there will be um a survey sent out after part two and at that point um you can fill out that survey and receive your certificate for cme moc um and, and participation as well um and if you're unable to attend part two i will make the slides um, available um afterwards so in this recording after this part one will be available as well if you'd like to review it again so the first question um, is cleveland metro school district school nurses were working with cwru this past year making attempts to screen pre-k and k students for lead poisoning obtaining parent guardian consent was extremely difficult despite numerous attempts including personal phone calls realizing the stigma regarding uh, lead poisoning do you foresee a way of medical centers and schools or daycare centers working jointly together to assist with lead poisoning screenings or making it mandatory requirements similar to immunizations? Thank you for the question. Um, I, can, I can start and then you can uh, chime in, Nick, with any additional insight. Um, one thing I will say is I, I, it's been very helpful that Head Start, so in our community, the, that the Head Start um, uh, enrollment process does require reporting of a lead test, um, just like uh, immunization records, and that's been a really helpful prompt. Um, so that's one example of how working together between um, the education uh, uh, sector and medical sector um, can be very helpful. Um, we're sort of still in that fact-finding mode with the, um, the testing that um, has been piloted in CMSD um, that's described in the question. Um, and I think there's a lot to discuss on this topic. I'll just say a couple things. Um, the solution to not testing enough 12 and 24 month olds who are at high risk is not necessarily to test more five and six year olds. So while the guidelines do say that if a high risk child has never had their blood drawn um, to check for lead levels uh, uh, under the age of six, that, that testing that child is recommended with appropriate follow-up, um, you know, there are kids who have a consistent medical home who've been tested at younger ages. There may be other issues going on with kids who don't have um, reliable connections to the medical home um, who are being identified in pre-K and in kindergarten. So, um, like I said, I think that particular project, we're still doing a lot of fact-finding about, um, about the impacts of testing those kids in CMSD. Um, I would say that the answer to the question is absolutely closer collaboration between um, schools and medical homes can be so beneficial, not just to make sure that lead testing occurs in a timely fashion, but also so that kids are plugged into primary care for all the other um, services. Um, and, and for those kids that aren't 
hooked up to a medical home who maybe are being picked up in pre-K and kindergarten, a lot of times those kids have other risk factors um, that help to explain why they don't have a relationship with a medical home, including, for example, housing instability, which itself is a risk factor for lead poisoning. So absolutely, I think there's an opportunity for, um, for closer connections between schools and, um, and primary care providers. Anything else you would add, Nick? I, 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 I don't think so, but I'm looking on to the next question too. And so, you know, what I, I'm thinking about is, um, you know, part of it is the, the community perception of, uh, of, of, you know, this stigma or like what are the implications of, of lead testing? And, um, you know, I'll be, I'll be completely honest, like at some level, you know, the parents um, are, are being kind of, you know, somewhat, they're being rational about it because they're like, well, you know, because I see a lot, I hear a lot of parents who say, well, why didn't they do something to test the house? Why are we testing my kid? And now my kid's got this problem and now I've got to move. And so I think, um, you know, you touched on a little bit earlier. I mean, I think, um, we're essentially using the, the children as lead detectors. And that's not really what like anybody wanted. I mean, like the original intent of the testing was to try to, you know, um, was to try to uh, uh, address some of society's ills, not, not create new ones. Now, the, you know, the, the question came in, and some mothers refused the lead test. I asked around and found out when they come back to check the house for high lead, some of them lose their children to other problems. Can they do that? So like the, the issue is like the people who come to visit the house, whether that be like a nurse or um, uh, particularly is usually a, a nurse case manager involved, they're mandated reporters. So if they find something that's, that's, uh, potentially um, hazardous to the, you know, to the child or, you know, some like bad situation, they have to report it by law. And so, I mean, I certainly have had a number of families um, um, who have refused, uh, you know, an inspection of the house, although they will have like, you know, they will uh, come in and get the lead tested. Um, and, you know, I, I can only speculate as to why. I mean, people are, are um, I mean, things that I've been told is that, you know, people are worried that they're going to lose their housing because maybe they don't have a, um, a legitimate uh, lease, you know, they may be subletting illegally, um, or uh, there may be other things going on in the house that if someone from the system were to see it, um, you know, it, it would be bad. So, um, the, so yes, I mean, the people who come out are mandated reporters for child abuse and neglect. And so if they find something, they will have to report it. Um, I, my experience with like families who have a child who has a lot high lead level and the health department, like taking the child away or something because of the lead is in my experience, and it, and it may be different in different parts of the, of the state. It's certainly quite different in Kentucky. Um, the, um, you know, taking the kids away because of lead is like uh, basically un almost unheard of. But the whole idea is to try to address the lead and help the family find, you know, a better housing situation. And the state has dedicated a good amount of resources to this. Um, but I, I don't know, hopefully that answers the, the question. If I could just chime in a little bit on that point, I think it's a really important one. Well, one of the things that I think has been so important here in Cleveland um, and I'm sure in other places as well, is to really work with parents and families and citizen advocates and community partners to, um, to collaborate with families who are at risk for lead exposure and to have some peer-to-peer um, -peer opportunities for education um, and prevention. Because um, I think that you know, some of those issues around inviting somebody into your home whom you don't know, who represents um, a governmental agency, those, those, that is anxiety provoking and, um, and really understandable. So I think having trusted community partners, parent advocates, and peer educators has been really helpful in earning trust 
from community members around um, lead prevention and um, working collaboratively with their primary care provider. The only other thing I'll mention about um, the, the question of testing um, in schools is just to kind of piggyback on what um, Dr. Newman just said with respect to sort of using kids as lead detectors, which is, is very true. Um, so a lot of the impacts that we see uh, related to lead exposure, as we mentioned, they, they come from population level studies. And so while the reference level is a public health action level for a, an individual patient, there's not always um, a specific intervention that we can recommend based on the lead level um, of that particular child. Like sometimes I think we're overstating um, the, 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 inter, the intervention, especially for those older kids, because for most of those kids, what's the, what's the, what, what's the recommendation if they have an elevated blood level, level? It's let's make sure you have a safe place to live, a nurturing education, educational environment, um, and uh, stimulation for healthy development, which is really what we should recommend for all children. So we're, we're here to say testing is really important at the recommended ages, and we know we have the the biggest opportunity to identify an issue and make meaningful interventions at those younger ages at 12 and 24 months. Um, but just to just to say like primary prevention is what we we all believe we should be investing most of our time and energy in. So testing at recommended times, absolutely. Um, but let's not overstate, you know, the specific interventions, um, you know, for those, especially for those pre-K and kindergarten kids, because those interventions that I just described, that's what every kid really deserves. If I just have uh just very briefly. The, the, the other thing, just my clinical experience over the years doing a lot of this lead work is that lead is like the tip of the iceberg for a lot of these families. Um, you know, and and the, there may be a lot of family dysfunction or other stuff going on, but the lead like, is like kind of a culmination of all of these different things. And when that's high, I mean, like in some kids it's dramatically high, you know, um, and um, you know, the higher it is, it seems like the more other stuff is going on. And so, um, you know, in, in in some ways, it it it's it's uh, as Dr. Bowl was saying, like this environmental justice or environmental injustice, it 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 plays in with a whole bunch of other factors, and it, it's something it's it, that's um, uh, you know, it's a number that's like like an absolute, like it's like, wow, yeah, th this is super high. And you know, not only do they have this problem with the lead, but the housing is falling apart and mom just lost her job and dad's in jail. And like, there's all these other things that are going on. And sometimes that's also an opportunity to try to get people help. Great, thank you. Thank you for those questions. Are there any other questions um, that we can answer quickly? Um, and if there are questions that you think of before part two that you would like answered, um, you can also email those to me and I'll share those with Dr. Bull and Dr. Newman and they can address them during part two of the presentation. Okay, if there's not any other questions at this time, I wanted to briefly discuss um, some of the resources that I had talked about earlier. We have an interactive website, um, which you can see you're able to type in your zip code or click on your county and um, see if it is uh, high risk or not, which is going to be great for the QI program that we have with um, primary care providers. We also have the resources for listed under um, providers. We have the family resources on their tab, education and training, which links to the um, registration form for our QI project and for um, and more information on our uh, regional trainings that we have upcoming, um, our spring meeting. We will also talk about lead. So to find out more information about that, you can click on that tab and then QI program, more information on our QI program. And then we also have the tab to link to the Ohio Department of Health um, lead website and then the CDC web website. Um, this is a photo of our family rat card. Um, there's more information on the back. It's full of information for you to share with families. Um, to use when you're doing um, well visits or or anything like that. You can download that on our um, website and then those that are participating in our QI project will receive some of these to share with families. <laughs>
And then we also have a resource guide for um, physicians. This resource guide is full of um, talking points, um, some clinical scenarios, just lots of information um, for physicians to use, um, especially during our QI project. So like I said before, if you're interested in participating, feel free to shoot me an email or you can um, click on that QI program tab on our website um, to sign up. There's a form there. Um, so at this time, um, we are done with part one of the training. So thank you again, Dr. Ball and Dr. Newman. And um, thank you to the Ohio Department of Health for their support and collaboration. And if you have any questions before part two, um, please send me an email and we'll make sure that those questions that you have are included um, in our part two presentation. You can find out more information about some of the programs that we have with the Ohio chapter um, AAP on our Facebook page, Twitter, our website, um, Instagram. We have lots of different social media, social media avenues um, for you to check out. So at this time, we will see you all for part two at 12.15 on um, Friday. We're excited to share more information about uh, testing and medical management um, and how you can really use some of the resources that we talked about um, in your practices, as well as um, during family visits and um, very different ways to use them. So thank you all so much.